right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Tanner. I'm a developer at Nervous Network. And today I'm going to be going over uh, writing smart contracts in Rust. So just a little background. Nervous Network uh, is kind of a collection of protocols. And the one of the biggest ones we have is called Common Knowledge Base, which is a layer one blockchain, we call it CKB for short, and it's a multi-asset store value blockchain. We're going to be seeing a little bit about what the multi-asset part entails. And essentially, um, we are able to create uh, custom assets on top of the blockchain, similar to uh, other smart contract platforms. Um, and we're a proof of work blockchain, and uh, it's more of a UTXO style blockchain as well. So generalized programmable UTXOs. Now the reason we're able to write smart contracts in Rust is because our virtual machine is a bit different from many different uh, virtual machines that you may see in other chains. Uh, it is just a virtual machine based on the RISC-V instruction set architecture. So it's, you know, it's, it's close to the hardware. And because of that, anything that compiles to uh, RISC-V uh, machine code is um, an, an available language for uh, writing code on and deploying it to the chain. So today I'm going to talk about the programming model, uh, kind of the conceptuals in the background, and then go through somewhat of a simple uh, smart contract design and development workflow. And then we'll get started on actually um, developing a particular uh, system on on Nervos. And throughout the course of this, you'll be introduced to a lot of uh, concepts and, as well as uh, a, a, a particular tool that we've released recently, uh, which is kind of a framework for building uh, smart contracts. And we won't get into everything uh, like testing the smart contract, for example, because of time constraints, but I'll point you in the direction uh, for learning more and we'll provide a, a link to the repo containing the code that uh, I write today as well as as well as the test for that code as well. So first let's go over the programming model <clears throat> and I mentioned that our state model is a generalized UTXO and the the fundamental state unit is we call it a cell so on the left you see that kind of from bitcoin utxos they have an amount in a lock right and we generalize this a little bit to four different fields uh, capacity data lock and type so capacity is measured in bytes or what we call ck bytes and that's actually the native the native uh, currency of the chain as well so a cell has a particular capacity and it cannot occupy more bytes than the capacity indicated in its capacity field. <clears throat> data is used to find data. So that can be anything. Um, it can be executable, uh, can be executable code or it can be any sort of um, state that you wish to store in the cell. Right? And then lock is similar to what you think about with UTXO lock scripts. So in order to spend or consume a cell, you need to be able to unlock it, right? And type is an interesting addition, which is another verification script. It's used to validate cell transformations. So whereas locks ensure that only the person or, or parties actually uh, who can unlock the cell can spend it or consume it, and therefore they operate on in inputs purely. A TypeScript executes on inputs and newly created outputs. Remember that because it's a UTXO style uh, chain, the cells, a transaction, which has cells as inputs and outputs, uh, cells are consumed and destroyed when they're used as inputs and created when they use as outputs. So how do we get a sense of continuity of state? Well, we have these TypeScripts that operate on inputs and outputs to verify that the state change uh, represented by the destruction of the previous state from inputs and the creation of new state outputs uh, is, is valid according to some 
user defined or developer defined business logic. And it's actually these lock and type scripts which constitute the uh, the usage of smart contracts on on uh, Nervo CKB. And lock and type scripts, well, they're called scripts. They're actually this simple data structure, this map that has uh, three fields. So there's the code hash, the arguments passed to the script, and then the hash type. Okay, and basically. Uh, the code hash <coughs> references references uh, a field on another cell. Either the ha it could be the hash of the data or the hash of the type field of another cell. And the reason for this is that if you want to reuse a script, well, you have to store that script somewhere. So you store it in a cell's data field, right? And we'll call that cell a code cell. And then it's potentially the case that you want to use the uh, the code stored in that cell. Uh, to verify many different cells. You want to attach it to many different cells. And so these lock and type fields are actually references to some other cell that contains the executable code. So the code hash uh, references references the cell by the hash of its data field or the hash of the type field. And that's, that's determined by a combination of the code hash itself and then the hash type, which can be either data or type. If the hash type of the uh, lock or type fields is data, then the code hash in that in that uh, script structure is referencing the uh, data field of some other cell. And for type, it's the hash of the type field. Right. So transactions then uh, are three big fields, inputs, outputs, and dependencies. Now the function of dependencies is that, okay, you have these, you have these cells and inputs and outputs which reference, reference other cells. And how do you find these cells? So it, would be, it would be pretty difficult to scan the entire chain for those um, every time you run a transaction, right? And so actually what's hap what happens is that uh, the dependencies or the, any sort of code cell that you need, or really even uh, cells that contain data that your transaction might need are included in the dependencies field. And the inputs, outputs, and dependencies uh, from, the develop, from the script developer's perspective are all just cells, right? Cells with these four fields. In reality though, uh, just like in Bitcoin, the inputs are actually just out points. They have a transaction hash, which references the transaction that uh, created the input as an output, and then the index of that reference cell in the outputs of the transaction with that transaction hash. And dependencies are similar. Uh, they're, they're out points, but they have this additional field depth type. And the reason for this is that uh, depth type can either be uh, code or it can be a depth group. And a depth group, all that is, is a cell which actually itself references a bunch of different dependencies. And this is useful if, say, you have three or four scripts uh, that you've developed and maybe uh, three of them, two or three of them are, are often used together. You can create a cell that's actually uh, a reference, a collection of references to each of these other dependencies that you need. And then you can just use that. So instead of including explicitly many different cells in the dependencies, if those dependencies are always going to be included together, you just create a dependency group and you only need one cell to bring in, to load in multiple different dependencies, right? But that's kind of sophisticated. We won't really need that today, but it's just some background. Uh, and then of course, these are the inputs and dependencies prior to script execution are resolved into the cells exactly like what you'd see in the outputs. So that's kind of a introduction to the state model and a bit of the program model. Now we'll go over a simple workflow for developing smart contracts. Essentially, yeah, the, the biggest part is defining the business logic, right? Uh, this is not just in smart contract design, this is in development in general. You need to understand the system and the rules prior to uh, writing any code, right? And so once you define a logic, 
you kind of have two different two different things you need to understand. The initial state of your system once it's deployed to chain, and then the verification code that implements the business logic that uh, th that your system uh, should follow. And notice here how uh, since the chain is generalized UTXO style, smart contracts or what we typically call them internally are just scripts or verification scripts are not these uh, are not these event based um, scripts or contracts that live on chain which you can call and then uh, and then wait for them to perform uh, cr perform some sort of side effect or update on chain state truly they're sim they're, they're just verification scripts when they're included in a transaction they ensure that the transaction satisfies some rule set according to whatever the code uh, that the developer has has written uh, actually says, right? So, uh, so you write the verification code, you write the initial state, and then, of course, the verification code cannot act on the initial state unless it's already living on chain. So once you have the initial state verification code, you deploy the code, and then you deploy the initial state uh, with 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 its references to the verification code that you've written. So the biggest part, like I said, is the business logic design, and the this is kind of a simple uh, modeling workflow that you can go that you can go through. Which is uh, before anything, you want to define the operations and queries that you want to support. Then you want to design the data structures, and that's essentially a, a process of determining what cells you need and what their the cells data fields should look like right and then since scripts or smart contracts themselves don't perform any sort of state updates they merely verify transactions which describe a state transition you need to uh, translate your operations into transactions or transaction sets. So a, a transaction is analogous to an operation. So what we're going to be going through today is a simple decentralized exchange. Uh, and I remember I said that it's a multi-asset chain. And that means that users, developers, can create their own custom assets, their own custom tokens. And we have a we have a standard. We have a few standards, but one of them is what we call the simple UDT standard, SUDT standard. That stands for just simple user defined token. You can think of it as similar to uh, Nervous Network's version of ERC twenty, right? So it's a fungible token, and uh, we'll go over we'll go over a couple of details about it. But basically. The purpose of this DEX is to allow users to purchase a newly created custom token uh, with native capacity, right? So we can kind of think of it as an issuance lock. It's it's not really a DEX in the in in the fullest sense of the word. It's just a, a lock script that allows users to uh, purchase a custom token, right? And the operations we want is if the operations relevant to this is, of course, minting um, or creating the token in the first place, issuing, and exchanging, which is the act of um, purchasing the custom token uh, by user, uh, and in return, the user pays the developer, the token creator, uh, proportional to the amount of tokens they've purchased, right? So this conceptually depends on the UDT standard or simple user defined token standard. And so let's go over what a cell, what a cell that complies with the standard looks like. And basically on the right here, you see this cell and um, its data field is a unsigned 128-bit integer. And the first so so the the first series of bytes in the data fields uh, is then treated as the amount of that token right so if a cell if a cell is a token cell then um, the data field is treated as the 
uh, is storing the amount of that particular token in, in the cell. And then the type field here, of course, the code hash references the UDT code cell, which remember that's what I'm calling the uh, a cell that contains the verification code, right? And then we have this thing called the governance lock hash. And basically the way that the user-defined token standard works is that um, if a, an input cell is locked with with, a, with the governance lock hash or with, with the lock script that hashes to this governance lock hash argument, then certain, certain verification rules are basically um, circumvented or foregone. And what this allows is uh, the developer to implement um, really sophisticated or simple, it's really up to the developer, uh, governance logic uh, while, while not needing to modify the verification code for the uh, token itself. And this allows, for example, uh, the person with governance permissions to mint new tokens after initial issuance uh, while, of course, preventing any user from minting new tokens. Otherwise, the, you know, the it would be kind of infinitely inflationary. And then the lock field of the, of the token cell is up to the user who's holding the token. And this is interesting because if you contrast it to Ethereum, where these balances of particular custom tokens are stored in a contract that kind of acts like a registry, right? Uh, uh, a mapping of uh, users to their balances. This is not the case on uh, Nervos. Rather, each, each holder of any custom token uh, controls the cell that, that stores their, their tokens. And they, can, they have complete control over the, uh, over the ownership logic. This also introduces um, opportunities for high levels of interoperability between different on-chain systems. Because both type and lock scripts have access to the entire transaction, uh, they can they can read any any data within the transaction, and then some and then block headers as well. But that's just an aside. Uh, that means that uh, other systems, say for example decentralized exchanges or lending protocols, can interoperate with the token standard uh, directly by simply providing a lock script that. Uh, that implements the custom uh, logic for that particular system. And users can opt in simply by uh, changing the lock field of their cell and participate in all these different systems with whatever custom token they're holding. So there's, so there's a lot of um, interoperability capabilities from this design. So in our, in our particular uh, case for the simple DEX, which is, like I said, really just an issuance lock, a way to purchase tokens. We're going to have the custom logic on the lock field. In that way, we can actually, when we, when we issue a new token, we're simply uh, placing a, a special lock on the token cells, um, on the token cells lock field, and users will be able to consume that particular that particular uh, token cell, uh, and then and then create an output that transfers some of the tokens uh, to themselves uh, by essentially creating a new token cell with a portion of the amount held in the issuance cell, and then of course the issuance cell, which is the cell depicted here with the dex lock will have to have its data field uh, modified for a decreased amount. But we can enforce things like the data field can be modified by users, but the type field cannot. Right? We can enforce these types of rules and allow people, uh, any user, any potential purchaser to consume this cell and therefore purchase tokens uh, so long as 
this same cell is created in the outputs um, according to certain rules that we'll define. So let's look at uh, mapping these operations like minting and issuing uh, to transactions. And you see here that I'm just depicting the transaction with inputs and outputs. And this looks exactly like how the, stand, how the token standard defines uh, issuance, where the input is any arbitrary cell, uh, but the, the lock field has to, be, has to have the governance lock. And that's because uh, the, token, the token script, uh, TypeScript, ensures that um, the inputs and outputs uh, store some total equal amount of the custom token. Now, of course, during issuance or minting, you're trying to create more output, uh, you're trying to create more tokens in the output than in the input because you have zero uh, tokens in the input, right? So we need to indicate that this is, this is permitted because we have governance permissions over this token. So we, we uh, include that cell with, that's locked with the governance lock and the inputs. And the governance lock can be any lock script. Uh, and then the outputs, we create a cell that's the token cell. And we can see that this is the case because the code hash has basically the, uh, of the TypeScript has the UDT definition, which is just another way of saying the, uh, it references the, the cell that contains the code that defines the verification logic for the token. And what's interesting is that in our system, since we're creating this issuance lock, this DEX, the lock field of the token cell created in the outputs has the DEX lock as its code hash. And you notice there are two arguments here. One is the rate. And the reason we need a rate is that's, that's, that's going to indicate to us how much native capacity, native currency, which is capacity, uh, how much capacity does each token cost? And then the payee lock, which is essentially uh, a lock hash indicating the uh, hash of the lock that um, that a cell that's transferring native capacity should be locked with. So you can think of it as um, who what who is being paid for the tokens. Now, in our simple example, it'll probably be the same address that created the tokens themselves, uh, but it doesn't have to be. You could. They, they could have, the, the token creator could have a, a, an address reserved purely for um, receiving payments for this, uh, for this token. Right. And we see here that we have three different code hashes and on the different fields of the, of the relevant cells. And that indicates to us that we need three different dependencies, right? We need the DEX lock, the governance lock and the uh, verification code for the for tokens themselves. Now, the governance lock can be anything, and uh, in our simple example, we'll probably just use use the default um, the default lock script uh, that that people have, which is just uh, secp two fifty six k one um, signature verification, and then. Uh, we have the DEX lock, which is what we'll be coding, and the token, the UDT definition cell, this, this that implements the uh, verification code for the user-defined token standard. Is um, we could write it ourselves, or we could use what's already deployed on chain, which is what we will do. And the exchange operation is a little more sophisticated where we actually have uh, we actually have two inputs, right? So first, the first input is, you'll notice, the actual issuance cell, which is the cell containing the tokens locked with the DEX lock, right? The second input, of course, we need the user in order to send capacity, in order to pay for the tokens they're acquiring, 
needs to consume a cell with enough needs to consume a cell or more than one cell so that they can transfer enough capacity to the to the payee in order to uh, verifiably purchase these tokens or validly purchase these tokens and the outputs uh, we're going to enforce that a new issuance cell is created in the outputs. In order for this transaction to succeed, that issuance cell needs to exist on the outputs too, right? And the type and lock fields should remain exactly the same. The only thing that should decrease is, is the amount of tokens stored in the issuance cell's data field. We also have a the second output, which is uh, capacity, but locked by the payee's lock, right? And so that cell there constitutes a payment to the address um, to the address that the token creator has uh, determined is the address that should receive payments in exchange for the custom token. And finally, the third output is a token cell another one a newly created token cell with its with its amount stored in the data fields as the 128 uh, bit unsigned integer and you see that it has the type and lock fields the type field is identical to the issuance cell because that uh, is what is that's responsible for storing the um, verification logic for this particular token the lock field, however, is different. It's not the DEX lock. It's whatever lock the user wants to, wants to attach to it because the user owns it, right? And we'll have to enforce rules about uh, the fact that the data in the output issuance cell um, is equal to the data in the input issuance cell uh, minus the amount of tokens purchased for example these are all the rules that we'll have to think about so just to recap what this state change is doing is we are decreasing the amount in the issuance cell uh, between the input and output so the purchaser is is making this change then capacity which is once again the native currency is sent to the uh, recipient who should be receiving payments for purchasing tokens. And then the custom token, some of the custom tokens proportional to how much capacity we've paid for is then sent to us basically. Or if, if we're the user, if we're the purchaser, then we create this output and send some to custom tokens to ourselves as well. So that constitutes what the operations will look like for um, both issuing and um, exchanging. And because of that, we, we understand what our initial state is going to be. It's going to be that, uh, it's going to be that particular um, issuance cell with the, which is just a token cell with the DEX lock, right? And in order to go from this to an actual on-chain system, well, first we need to write the, we need to, either ensure that these dependency scripts already exist on chain or write them ourselves and then deploy them to chain. And after that, we'll deploy the initial state. So now we'll get into some of the actual uh, smart contract development practices. And what we'll be doing is using a new tool that Nervous release called Capsule. Capsule is a framework for developing scripts in Rust. So you are provided with boilerplate, you can create projects, and you can then develop scripts, you can write tests for those scripts, and you can also deploy those scripts to uh, a local developer chain, um, testnet or mainnet, all from, all from Capsule. And Capsule creates a couple different uh, modules for you. Um, and we'll see this itself, but you basically, you'll have the build for the contracts that you actually compile, um, the contracts module where you actually develop your contracts, and then the tests. Okay, so I'm just going to pull up 
that capsule now. And before we go into developing, I want to show you some useful resources and links that you can use. So capsule is uh, Nervous Net GitHub on GitHub, Nervous Network slash capsule. It has, an, it has a great wiki here that walks through setting it up and actually building or implementing the uh, user-defined token um, contract. So it's a contract that's compliant with the user-defined token standard. And what's, what's actually interesting here is that Capsule uses these other libraries. Um, and Cap the Rust using Capsule is actually no standard Rust. So you kind of think of it like embedded systems development. However, we provide uh, CKB, something like a library called CKB standard and CKB types, which allow for uh, the use of richer data structures and system calls um, for this no standard Rust, right? And the documentation with these is very useful. I'll probably have to refer to it myself uh, during, during this little demo here. But we see that CKB standard has these various has these various modules, and the two will be the three will be using the most is CKB constants, high level, and syscalls. Now syscalls provide support for all the system calls that a script can execute, right? So if we want to load a cell or we want to load a script, load a transaction, that type of thing. Uh, and then high level are kind of these nice uh, wrappers around around the system calls to provide some an easier interface and uh, some some additional functionality right so technically all of the things included in high level all of the functions you can you can achieve all of this functionality without using the high level module uh, using purely the system calls and syscalls but it's easier to use this one needed so then we have that and now then we also have uh, CKB types and the bulk of it is in the packed module, which provides these data structures out of the box for all of these different types of um, data that, that, the, uh, that the system calls and whatnot might return. So if we just go to outpoint, for example, we can, we can load in an outpoint and you know that as a at the system call level that may be just a series of bytes but we can initialize an outpoint structure from those bytes and all of the sudden we have access to these simple methods that can allow us to extract the transaction hash in the index for example okay So I'm just going to pull up the code editor and we'll get started on actually coding some things up and really due to constraints here, we'll just be kind of sketching out a, um, a skeleton of the project, get to some of the functionality, but uh, I'll provide a link uh, afterward so that you can, you can get into uh, more depth on developing the script and writing tests and seeing the full code that results from it. Okay. Okay, so I have my code editor up here and I have Capsule installed already. Capsule is really easy to install and you can follow the uh, GitHub repo, uh, wiki, nervous network slash capsule for that. But I'm just going to create a new project, Unitize Workshop. It already exists, so I will create one called Simple Dex. And that's just a capsule new command, and it's going to create all these things for us. Just creating a couple of packages. 
um, the, the actual binary, uh, binary package and the tests as well. So we'll go to that now. And let's see. Frankly, I don't usually use this text editor, so I forget how to um, open uh, or enable the command line options. So I will just go this way. Okay, so we have this, we have our structure. I'll skip that for now. We have our structure here, our project structure. So uh, there's build, you know, that's where uh, the contracts we actually compile are. And where we're going to be working is really inside the contracts in the main, main RS. So like I said, it's no standard. So um, there's a bunch of setup here uh, for using core instead of standard library. And then we have these are imports for our actual, um, for our CKB specific uh, libraries and we can change these as well. And this is just the template that Capsule sets up for you. And then uh, this we can ignore, right? This uh, really just, ensures that um, the system API uh, of the virtual machine is, is, is followed. And really it's going to call this, it's going to call this main function, which is defined below. We also have um, this error enum here where we can define our custom errors and uh, it'll just work, right? So this is the main function. And you can see it's remove below examples and write your own, your code here. So this is where we get into uh, where we'll write our code uh, and and um, execute it. So I'm going to get a terminal and running to make this a little bit bigger. Okay. So what's one thing that we want to? Uh, what's one thing that we want to basically? And sure, remember we have three outputs in our in, in our expected exchange, right? So the first output uh, is the issuance cell. The second output here is the um, is the payment cell. And the third output is of course the user's custom token cell that they purchased, right? So, of course, we need to enforce a certain set of rules on these things, right? Um, and before we do any of that, we really need to, we really need to uh, be able to load in the issuance cells and um, ensure the, the rate, right? And so that's what we'll do is we will, focus on loading in the issuance cells um, or certain certain parts of them at least, right? And so let's do, and we also wanna load in the arguments, right? Because the arguments contain the payee lock and the rate. So that's what, that's what, we'll, that's what we'll do. So we see that there's already this system call for loading the scripts and we unpack it into bytes and bytes, we can, uh, bytes just data structure, but we can compare them uh, with vectors of, of um, bytes or arrays of bytes, et cetera. So um, there are two arguments here, two arguments. The first is the rate, which is, which denotes capacity, right? And capacity or CK bytes is a constant 64 byte integer. And the second argument is the pay lock, 
and the payee lock is going to be um, a 32 byte hash of a lock field, right? So uh, because of that, I'm going to, I'm going to define two, uh, two things here, um, rate bytes, which is just going to be a byte array. Um, it's a 64 bit number, so it's going to be eight bytes long. And then I'm going to do the same thing um, for the pay lock. And this is basically, I'm just trying to get these into their own, their own data structures uh, outside of the args bytes, which is just easier. Not necessarily the best way always, but um, easier to reason about as we kind of develop a prototype here. And we can, of course, from these, from these arrays, we can, we can copy from slice, which is a, a method. So we can copy the uh, contents of a slice from somewhere else to the, to these uh, arrays. So that's what I'm going to do. And we want the first eight bytes from the args. And then for pay lock bytes, we want basically the rest of them, right? Now, right now, this contract is assuming that those are the only two arguments. And that's the assumption we're going to make for this particular um, prototype. And then, uh, it's in the, the by order for this virtual CKB virtual machine is in little endian. So we're actually going to uh, make the rate itself. Remember it's a U64 uh, from the bytes of the rate bytes. And we can just pass rate bytes in, we won't need it again. Right? It's only necessary to get this rate. So now we have the rate and the pay lock. That's just that's just an array of bytes. We don't really need to do anything else to it after that. Uh, now we need to let's see what do we want to check first. Um, let's check that the uh, let's check that the mm, we'll load in the issuance cells because we want to load in the issuance cells and then. Um, from the difference in the issuance cells amount field, that will allow us to get the um, to get the actual amount that the user has to pay. So we will say issuance cells equal load issuance cells. And notice that this returns a result. This uh, this main method returns a result. So we're just going to um, just going to make the uh, error handling uh, simple. And so once we have load issue itself, which is just a hypothetical, hypothetical function, we don't have it yet. Once we have those issue in cells, we need to calculate the minimum payment. So, and the minimum payment will need uh, two things. It'll need the issue in cells so that it can check the difference in the amount fields. And it will also need the rate, so it can use the rate and the amount and the uh, amount that the user has purchased in order to determine the final um, fee that or payment that the user must provide. So we'll calculate min payment. Uh, just the second function we don't yet have, and that's going to take the rate and U64. It's a it's a copy. It's a copy type, so we if we pass it in, we don't have to worry about um, any sort of uh, ownership issues necessarily. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I actually have to check the documentation uh, to ensure, but yeah, it's a primitive type, so it should be copy. Um, and then and then we would need the issuance cells, right? Which are going to be custom, probably uh, for for making it easier. We'll have this load issuance cells be probably a tuple of um, of two custom structures for us, right? And that's also going to return error uh, error handling. And then 
once we know the minimum payment, we probably want to get the payment amount. Now, in order to get the payment amount that the user actually paid, we will probably need to, uh, to check uh, which outputs are locked with the particular pay lock, right, with this lock, and check that the capacity, the sum total capacity of those cells is equal to this, is at least equal to this minimum payment, if not greater. You're always allowed to pay more, right, but you can't pay less than the minimum. So we'll, we'll say that um, let payment amount And that will take the reference to the log bytes. Payment. And then our the big logic that we want is basically if the minimum payment is greater than the payment amount, we need to return an error. Right? We return an error, and we're going to use our custom errors here. Payment not enough. Now, this error doesn't exist yet, but what we can do is we can scroll up and just add right here. Now that error is valid. It's valid error code. Uh, okay, so. Let's focus on loading the issuance cells. And that's probably all we'll have time to get to. But like I said, I'll provide the GitHub link to see all of this code. Um, so what does load issuance cells take for an argument? Nothing, okay. And load issuance cells, it's going to return a result. We know that. and it's going to return, like I said, a tuple of issuance cells, right? One for input, one for output. So I'm probably going to define this custom type here. And then return an error. Uh, and so I actually have to define the structure for the, the custom structure uh, of my issuance cell, right? And the issuance cell, uh, let's define it here. It has a couple of different things. So we want to indicate if it's from the inputs or outputs. So it's going to have this source. And the CKV constants defines this enum of source, which can uh, indicate an input or output. We, of course, have to, uh, we have to um, include that here. Okay, so that's CKB constants. So we're going to include those, and that allows us that'll that'll bring in this source enum for us. Now the data uh, is going to be a vector of bytes, right? So we're just going to say vector of bytes. It's going to have a lock hash too, right? And we need that because we want to ensure that the lock hash, um, lock hash doesn't change. The data is going to contain the amounts which we'll want uh, in order to compare and determine the minimum payment amount. And the lock hash, uh, well, we need to ensure that the issuance cells, their lock hashes remain the same. So, and that's going to be, we can just make that. Uh, statically sized array because the hash is going to be 32 bytes long. The index, so we might need to access these issuance cells later or access other fields in them uh, through other syscalls. So it's nice to have the index of the cell in, its, in the inputs or outputs. That's going to be U size. And then finally, its capacity, right? We're going to want to make sure that the capacity doesn't change um, even even though a purchaser is purchasing this issue and sell want to make sure the capacity hasn't changed okay so uh, in order to load the issue and sell how do we know if a cell is an issue and sell well essentially it's going to have a special lock hash right 
and a script has access to everything in a transaction, including itself. So we can use this cool method. It's just call called load script hash, which will return uh, the script hash. Uh, and that's a high level method. So we need to bring it into scope there. And I'm just going to refer to the documentation and check if that returns an array or probably an array of bytes. Yep, it returns a static sized array, uh, 32 bytes long. Okay. Where am I? All right. So I have that, and um, I can actually. Uh, look for the input issuance um, by iterating through the uh, outputs, right? So what I'm going to do is keep track of an index here. I'm going to loop. And I'm going to check that, um, actually, I can use a special structure that's inside of the high level called query iter, which allows us to kind of query the transaction and search for certain things um, with a custom iterator. So I'm going to uh, say that so this is just this is just um, input issuance cell. That's what we're looking for here equals, and then it's basically, it's going to execute a particular, a particular uh, system call, such as the loading the lock hash on all cells from a specific source, and we're going to say source input. So I have to bring in load cell lock hash, which also happens to exist in the high level. And so I will get back down here. All right. And uh, this, this provides a way to, I can, it's just an iterator. So I can execute, I have a bunch of different functions I can call that take closures. So I'm going to use find here. Uh, it's going to pass in the result of this, of this system call to the closure. So find lock hash. And basically, I just want to check that um, the lock hash equals this lock. So if their bytes are equivalent, then I want to return that result. And I also, I want to actually keep track of the, um, of the index because remember, I want to return from here issuance cells, and so I have to keep track of that as well. Uh, okay, so I once I'm done with that, um, I just want to check if I want to handle the case where it was not found, right? And if it wasn't found, basically, um, this this whole iteration is going to return uh, either it's going to return an option with a wrapped value. So basically, if we can check if it's, if it's sum or none with this method here, and then if it isn't sum, that means that it did not find it. We want to return an error, say cannot find issuance, something like that, right? And then just like before with our workflow, when we define a new error, we want to define it in our custom error enum. Okay. So, and then we'll basically do the same thing. Well, we will do the same thing for output. Let's just load in some other portions of the issuance cell. Uh, so, 
high level module also has a load cell capacity. And since, um, since we have this I here, now I'm pretty sure that this will stop at the first instance that it returns, it returns true, right? Uh, so I'm pretty sure that after this iteration, I will be equal to the index of the issue itself. But uh, like many people, I don't remember all of these things off the top of my head. So I have to check the documentation. But for now, we'll just assume, right? Uh, so, and tests, te writing tests later helps, helps uh, flesh out which assumptions were correct and which were not anyway. So uh, I can load cell capacity by passing in the right index and then the source. So I'll say source input. And all system calls return, have that, have that result return. So we're just going to um, handle them uh, with the convenient syntax here. So I have the incapacity and I also want to load in the data. So we'll say in data equals load cell data. And then I will, I will uh, initialize my structure. So this will be one of the issuance cells that I return and I give it the index, the source we know is source input. And what else does it, what else does it need? The log hash, the data, and the capacity. Okay. So we need capacity. We can just take ownership of these things. And finally, the lock hash. Now, the lock hash will just basically own that for now uh, so that it has its own copy there. And that's going to be the issue itself. Now, we'll just do the same thing. We do the same exact thing for outputs. Then we return basically a result with um, issue and sell, let's say input and we return we do the same exact thing return another one issue and cell output right? but uh, due to time constraints like i said we're not going to be able to get through nearly all of this functionality but uh some things to take away from this are that there's a pretty pretty uh straightforward workflow here um especially one that i like to follow is i just define the high level logic with these hypothetical functions and then I uh, begin implementing them one by one and as I need new errors I just scroll up to this nice error enum that capsule provides and I uh, write in my errors and as I need new system calls like load cell log hash um, load cell capacity and load cell data I'll just I'll just add those in, right? And in order to do this, technically, it's very useful to have the documentation open. And like I mentioned before, the documentation, uh, the best way to find it is by going to the capsule wiki on GitHub, going through the tutorial first, of course, and then um, and then looking at the various libraries it depends on, like CKB standard and CKB standalone types. And then, uh, and then switching back and forth between coding and reading those whenever, whenever you need to, because uh, you know, a lot of stuff returns these byte, a lot of calls return byte arrays. And uh, you can use the types in order to uh, cast those cast those collection of bytes to particular um, data types and uh, make things a lot easier, right? So that's really, that's really all I have. Uh, if you're interested in continuing this exploration since we've only just begun uh, coding up this script, uh, I welcome you to, to 
go to the GitHub link, which I'm about to about to show you. Um, if I can pull up the if I can pull up the slides again here uh, and look at the complete version of this of this code as well as the as well as the tests because it's probably the case that some of the things I wrote in this demo may may fail tests right so that's why we have tests uh, anyway here is here is the link uh, Wilfred TA slash unitize workshops for the completed version of the code and uh, that's all I have thank you for thank you for joining and um, happy to take any any other questions that people haven't haven't asked yet and feel free to submit issues or something there um, if you see any anything wrong or um, you want to add any functionality yourself all right thank you